Hi everyone, Zoe Trivic here. Welcome to this, the very first installment in a brand new sporadic channel feature that I'm going to call Cinespection. And um, yes, before you ask, I finally wrote a script for once, so um, you know, it's professional me. Hopefully this means this will be a less rambly video than some of my prior to camera pieces. We'll see. Anyway, um, the idea here is not to review films per se, but to explore the way that specific themes or social issues are communicated via this medium. Um, and since I wouldn't want to ruin any cinematic twists and turns for anyone, um, my goal is to avoid spoilers. I mean, beyond those that are already revealed in the trailer. I hope that's fair. I need something to be able to talk about sometimes. So, um, with luck, your film-going experience may even be enhanced by having watched this video before seeing the movie. I mean, a gal can always dream, right? So, um, without further ado, let's dive in. Um, in what's likely to be one of our last cinema trips for the foreseeable future, back in early March, my wife and I went and saw the 2020 uh, release of The Invisible Man, starring Elizabeth Moss. Um, I felt it was really nicely executed. I mean, apart from my usual quibbles with most Hollywood forays into science fiction. In Moss's performance, in the role of Cecilia Cass, a, um, a survivor of long-term psychological abuse by a controlling ex-boyfriend, was utterly convincing. Um, so I'd, I'd strongly recommend the film. Don't know when you'll get a chance to see it with the pandemic progressing, but just you know, put it on your to-watch list at some point. However, um, when we got home and compared our takes on it, it became apparent that uh, certain aspects had impacted my wife far more viscerally than they had me. Um, despite me perceiving the protagonist's plight as horrific, I'd left the cinema, I don't know, heartened by the resolve that Cecily had shown in the face of her abuser's many, many attempts to make her doubt her insanity and ultimately to forfeit her agency. By contrast, um, my wife had found the movie, movie um, utterly terrifying and confided that she wasn't sure she'd be able to sleep that night. So, um, without delving too deeply into this apparent disconnect, I'd like to use The Invisible Man as a springboard to discuss today's key concepts of bodily autonomy and gaslighting. So let's take these in turn. Bodily autonomy, um, or more broadly, bodily integrity, can be defined as the fundamental human right of self-governance over one's physical body, free from any form of external coercion. I mean, imagine most people would accept the axiom that, you know, barring extreme circumstances like incarceration or emergency hospitalization, um, everyone should be able to self-determine what they do with and what is done to their own body. Um, so essential, in fact, is this concept that the philosopher Martha Nussbaum uh, included bodily autonomy as one of the ten central capabilities that any state entity must secure for all of its inhabitants in order to be considered morally decent. Unfortunately, despite this, uh, routine violations of bodily autonomy abound in every corner of the world. I mean, from the state imposing, imprisoning, say, vast segments of the population um, on typically very specious grounds, um, to industries which force people to live in polluted areas by externalizing their environmental costs, um, to unethical employers who impose nightmarish working conditions on their labor forces. Gosh, I don't know who I'm talking about. Anyway, um, however, these are all systematic examples, uh, which in truth each probably deserve their own video series. So today let's instead focus on the specific intersection of bodily autonomy with domestic abuse that is communicated and examined in The Invisible Man. So, um, one of the things that elevates this 2020 release over earlier spins on the classic tale is the decision to have the narrative revolve not around the eponymous male inventor, but instead around his girlfriend. Now, I feel a strong argument can be made that invisibility suits are inherently sinister, um, particularly considering, you know, how they would inevitably be used by police and military forces to basically further subjugate the populace and suppress any dissent. However, in this film, it's clear that this technology is just the latest weapon in a vast, and albeit typically more mundane, um, arsenal that Cecilia's abusive partner has wielded against her over the entire course of their relationship. 
So I'm gonna play a quick clip, and unfortunately because I didn't check to see how long it was, I'm just gonna sit here, so we're gonna probably have a cut in the video. But this is Cicely describing the situation herself. So I'll be right back. Adrian? He was a sociopath. He said that I could never leave him. He controlled how I looked and what I wore. Then it was controlling when I left the house. And eventually, what I thought. Okay, must be over by now. Uh, in the future, I will make those notes, and that way I can do this professional. I could just queue it up and we can watch it together. That's, you know, how a professional would have done this, but I'm learning people. Give me time. So anyway, um, I included this clip for several reasons. I mean, first, Cecilia describes her ex as a sociopath. Now, whilst the terms sociopathy and psychopathy have fallen out of favor with the psychiatric profession, they do correspond to what is generally called antisocial personality disorder, for which he indeed meets several key diagnostic criteria. I'll list them. Um, the most prominent of these, obviously, is a lack of empathy for other human beings and a profound inability to feel remorse for one's actions or for their consequences. Now, as her ex-boyfriend understandably gets very little screen time here, I mean, the film is called The Invisible Man, after all, um, key elements of his personality are represented by proxy throughout the film. I mean, for instance, at the very start, his sprawling seaside residence is externally modernist, but um, its interior evokes brutalism in these cold, cavernous spaces framed by poured concrete. Um, and obviously these, this typifies what we would normally call an architecture of control. I mean, here it's a de facto prison to isolate Cecilia from the outside world, but it's one with a veneer of respectability, so this tells you a lot about the character of her ex. Similarly, um, the film repeatedly uses his brother, who, conveniently enough, has been entrusted with the role of executor of the will as a stand-in for specific negative character traits, which are implied to run in the family. I mean, even if viewed from a purely legal standpoint, he serves as an effective surrogate antagonist and an extension of his brother's malice towards Cecilia. Um, and whilst there are no flashbacks to scenes of earlier domestic abuse portrayed in the film, thankfully, uh, the fact that Cecilia actually pauses in her desperate escape attempt long enough to remove a tracking collar from the, the dog that she and her ex have shared sends the audience a very clear message about the way her, she herself has been treated throughout their relationship. Now observe how Cecilia distills the central threat that he posed to her in eight devastating words. He said that I could never leave him. Now, those fortunate enough never to have experienced an overly controlling relationship or culture may not appreciate why she would choose that one aspect to highlight of all the things she might have said to convey the sheer precarity of her situation. And the reason she did is because bodily autonomy is an apex human right upon which nearly all others are inherently contingent. I mean, once that's taken away from you, every other aspect of your existence is thrown into question. I mean, you become subject to the whims of whatever person or system has decided it owns you. This is the, the true horror of this film, and it's savagely driven home towards the very end of the film when there's one final secret violation that comes to light. Again, no spoilers, but oh my god. Um, but anyway, returning to the voiceover, Cecilia mentions several real-world coercive techniques that are commonly used by domineering partners to violate the autonomy of their lovers or spouses. And these gradually escalate in severity. So she starts by saying, he controlled how I looked. Now this could easily apply to garden variety, run-of-the-mill negging or body shaming, or to something darker, like literally dictating what a, one's partner is permitted to eat or drink or how they even style their hair. She then says, and what I wore. And this is another red flag, suggesting that he viewed her as just another one of his many possessions. In this case, an animate doll to be dressed and manipulated as he saw fit. And then he was controlling when I left the house. This underscores the common personal and sociocultural tactic of denying women freedom of movement and association with others of their own choosing. 
This never happens by accident, by the way. Such measures are always driven by desire to deny the victim agency and to cut them off from sources of external information and support. In this case, um, we also witness a narcissistic abuser who feels the victim's entire world should revolve around and belong to him. Now, Cecilia ends this, this little bit of the narrative with, and eventually, what I thought. Now, while some may argue that one's own mind remains the ultimate refuge from whatever depredations might be visited upon us in our lives, at least for now, I suspect what she meant here is an aggressive policing of the sorts of opinions that she was permitted to express. Um, sociopaths routinely use intimidation, emotional manipulation, and the implicit threat of subtle retribution to force their victims to agree with viewpoints that are anathema to them. However, if she did mean this literally, then there's one obvious and sadly very effective technique that he almost certainly would have used to make her second guess her own thoughts and this is gaslighting. So, to quote Wikipedia, gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation in which a person or group covertly sows seeds of doubt in a targeted individual, making them question their own memory, perception, or judgment. Using denial, misdirection, contradiction, and misinformation, gaslighting involves attempts to destabilize the victim and delegitimize the victim's beliefs. So again, we aren't shown flashbacks of prior abuse in The Invisible Man, but everything after Cecilia escapes from his isolated walled compound clearly establishes gaslighting as her ex-boyfriend's preferred tactic of control. All of this is, of course, vastly facilitated by the science fictional conceit of an invisibility suit. There are also several commonplace instances depicted throughout the film. The first of these is at the Bull reading itself, where his attorney brother, again filling the role of proxy antagonist, insists upon reciting a prepared statement that essentially seeks to gaslight her from beyond the grave. I'll play it now. As the attorney representing Adrian's trust, I'm required to read a prepared statement. Cecilia, although our relationship was far from perfect, I thought that you would talk to me rather than run away. Are you okay? Okay, I'm assuming it's done. Here we have the clear implication that it was Cecilia, not her abusive ex, who was the unreasonable one. I mean, this is classic blame the victim. Uh, that she didn't even attempt to talk about her concerns before fleeing. That he would have been responsive to them had she done so. Even before her sister moves to halt the reading, a clear pattern has emerged of a technique known as countering. This is where an abuser calls the victim's memory into question by painting an alternate and purely fictitious framing of the same series of events. Another mundane example is the, um, the later infiltration of her email account to send her sister an acrimonious message that's basically engineered to make the latter abandon Cecilia. It's very typical of those who engage in gaslighting to not only target their intended victims, but to also seek to turn any family, friends, or colleagues of theirs against them. As Cecilia's external support network appears to consist solely of her sister, a friend on the police force, and his daughter, um, it's unsurprising that uh, efforts are made to undermine each of these personal connections and manipulate them into mistrusting her as the narrative plays out. Um, similarly, all of Cecilia's attempts to rebuild her life after escaping his clutches are undermined through subtle acts that are designed to make her doubt her own sanity. For instance, there's a scene, um, she's applying for a job, and in the middle of the job interview, she discovers that the entire contents of her architecture portfolio have gone mysteriously missing, even though she put them in there that morning before leaving for the interview. I mean, obviously, it would spoil the plot to give specific details of how invisibility itself is deployed as a gaslighting tool. So um, I'll leave those up to your imagination, and you should see the film, really. But suffice it to say that in the real world, no such futuristic tech is needed to progressively destroy a person's confidence and self-esteem, nor does it help that women are societally conditioned to be less assertive and more self-doubting and more introspective than men, making them easier targets for precisely these sorts of psychological attacks. So, to conclude, I feel this 2020 release of The Invisible Man is not only vastly superior to prior cinematic spins on this classic H.G. Wells story, which admittedly is 
not saying much, um, but is a compelling film in its own right. Although the narrative does rely upon the science fictional framing, it's deployed with remarkable restraint so that it doesn't drown out the core theme of individual resilience in the face of sustained psychological abuse. I'd argue the film succeeds in evoking a profound sense of horror, much more effectively through its portrayal of all too familiar patterns of real world abuse in terms of bodily autonomy violations and gaslighting than through this futuristic technology by which the heroine is targeted. And that wraps up episode one of Cinespection. Um, I hope you liked it, but as always, uh, let me know in the comments so I can do better next time. And um, yeah, oh, by the way, feel free to recommend other films and other themes. Don't just say I want this film reviewed because these aren't film reviews, but if you think that a film portrays certain themes of interest, well, shoot me a comment and uh, maybe I'll do another Cinespection of that one at some point. But until then, um, bye. <laughs> Well, wasn't that fun? If you agree, there's a few things you can do, like click the like button or leave me some feedback as a comment or subscribe if you're not already subscribed to my channel. All of these things help. And if you'd like to move beyond that and support the channel and the videos I do in a more substantive fashion, I've listed a number of sort of donation options here on this final slide. Right, I think that's about it, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in future videos. Take care.